VG Acquisition Corp or VGAC stock, otherwise known as the Virgin Group SPAC is merging with 23andMe. The deal is expected to close mid 2021 where it'll go from trading as VGAC stock to ME stock or ME stock. So what is 23andMe? 23andMe is a pioneer in the genomic revolution. They're a direct to consumer spit in the kit genetic testing and analysis company. They've collected the genetic profile of over 10 million people around the world and the potential with this information is enormous. I mean, they're just scratching the surface with some of these things, like the potential for consumers to learn about their genetic predispositions or potential genetic fate, one could argue, while drug companies might now be able to produce more effective treatments faster. While the potential is huge, the business model is currently undergoing a radical transformation and the financials just aren't there yet. We'll get into more of that a little later in this video. This was just the, the quick overview for those that wanted the, the 30 second download. Now I'll go through the full detail. But first, this video goes out to Adil, JJR, and Yash, who are all Unrivaled Investing Journey subscribers. Now, what do I mean by that? A quick 10 second plug, if you will. You are watching Unrivaled Investing. My name is Daniel. This is a no hype mission focused channel to try to find you exceptional companies and unrivaled investments. If you like learning about potential multibaggers, make sure you subscribe. Multibaggers are types of companies that could potentially go up hundreds or thousands of percent. If you enjoy watching these videos, please make a point of hitting that thumbs up. It does help with the proliferation. And if you want to follow my personal journey as I try to find these potential multibaggers for my own investment portfolio, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey. Now let's dig into 23andMe. So what's the deal that's going on? So you have this VG Acquisition Corp or Virgin Group SPAC VGAC, which will be turning into me stock. You have a lot of cash coming in, nearly $800 million. The vast majority of it is going to the balance sheet, nearly $700 million. Now we'll get into why so much cash is going into the, the balance sheet and why they need it a little bit later on in this video. And the rest just goes to the bankers. So this is a very, I'd argue, straightforward deal. Now, what is 23andMe? 23andMe has been around for a long time, actually, for, for a startup, for a company that's just coming public now, where it was labeled as one of the best inventions, not in 2018, but 2008, a decade earlier, by Time Magazine, the retail DNA test, where it's the first in the kind, spit in the, tit, you know, spit, spit in the kit, uh, saliva-based direct-to-consumer genetic testing. That's what it is. You know, you pop the top and you spit, you know, spit a couple of times and you, you mail it back and they're going to send you your profile. And there's a lot of information there. And what's gone on since then? Well, they've upped their game. You know, now the packaging looks better. This you, here's the kit where you, you pop it and you spit up to spit up to line. Then you close it and mail it off. And they have over 10 million people that have been genotyped customers, which is way more over 10 X larger than some of their, the, I'd argue their competitors that are equally building up genetic, you know, data banks. So why do people want to learn about their genetics? And there's a lot of reasons why, you know, one is to find out where, where you're from. Like, here's this lady. She's like, Oh, you have 46% from Vietnam and probably from Ho Chi Minh city. And then, you know, here you can look up, Holy smokes. My great grandmother was a lot busier than I thought. I have all these fourth cousins. Like this is incredible. And look at where they live. Um, then next is like, Oh, you know, I'm more likely to have photo bleaching or like, Hey, 56% of people with results like yours prefer chocolate ice cream. For me, I like it's 100% know that I prefer chocolate ice cream, but hey. Um, but it's more than just traits in ancestry. There's also a health angle. So it's not just the fun aspect of like, hey, how much of a, you know, how, how much do you, you know, how likely is it that you're going to be uh, a chocolate lover of vanilla or how likely are you to lose your hair? There's a healthcare angle to it, which is maybe you can get better treatment knowing how other people just like you with similar genetic predispositions have fared. And that's where this health predisposition angle is so helpful, where it's like, hey, 37% of people with your genetic, you know, sort of codes or similar codes, you know, had type two diabetes. So your genetics are associated with a typical likelihood. Or some people are saying you're 7% you're less than average, your genes predispose you to lower weight, which for me is obviously impossible if I'm a big lover of chocolate. But this is like, it, it, it creates this helpful mosaic for you to think about your healthcare profile, which becomes super helpful 
as you work with your primary care physician, say, hey, you know what? My genetic profile does suggest that I'm at a higher risk for type 2 diabetes. That's a good data point for your primary care physician to know. It's also helpful for you know carrier status where you can know, oh, what are the genes that I could be passing down if I'm planning on having kids? So pre-pregnancy planning, like what type of kids might I want to have? You know, what, what type of tests do I need to have? on you know on a uterus um you know on on the kids in utero for like do, do we need to test for cystic fibrosis sickle cell anemia um tay sachs disease so you can see there's the pre-pregnancy planning aspect so it's not only your health and how you can make sure you're optimizing and making sure you're not going down you know a bad path or, or understanding hey people like me generally are overweight or underweight um, it's also a way of thinking, you know, multi-generational from a pre-planning, pre-pregnancy planning perspective. Okay, so I can see the value of healthcare-related, you know, angle, but there's there's actually a lot more to that. Like, what else is going on in the story? And that gets to this flywheel where they're saying, look, we get all these customers, over 10 million profiles that we've we've gone through, the you know, profiling these people's genes, and you're able to do this research over 80% of the people opt in to say, Hey, we want to participate in the research. And that's going to help drive this dis drug discoveries and novel consumer products. And, you know, viewers, you'd want to spend an extra minute just looking at this because I'd argue this is where the company is looking to go in the future. This is going to be, if this company, this is the $10 billion question, this is the 20, $30 billion question for 23andMe is can they succeed in these two areas? And their arguing is, hey, we get 30,000 daily surveys completed, sent in, where people are saying, yes, I do prefer chocolate, or yes, I do have a heart condition. And they're checking that data against your genetic profile and saying, hey, we're learning more and more about humanity and its various different genes and how that triggers into these different outcomes. And based on that information, we're going to be able to come up with more and more exclusive consumer products. We already have these sort of high-level consumer products, but now we're going to start offering these novel or exclusive products, um, and it'll get only more and more detailed as we get more and more surveys. And then this other component of drug discoveries. Maybe we can come up with stuff that's more effective faster. Let's go into each of these components, starting with novel consumer products. So what do I mean by novel consumer products? They just launched in October 2020 a new subscription or a membership service for 29 bucks a year starting in October 2020 where you can see you know just getting the ancestry or traits is 99 bucks if you want to get the health angle that's 199 bucks plus the ancestry and then you get this membership you where it's recommended to get this where oh it's clearly better it's 169 bucks plus this 29 this seems worthwhile um what's what's the deal here what's the exclusive content here and you can see here and it's only been a soft launch so far but they've already gotten 75,000 people to sign up for this annual membership which is pretty interesting for 29 bucks and you can see it's an it's an extra layer of detail like this pharmacogenetics report where it includes this medicine cabinet where you can type in the medications you're on and they can see if it it sort of works well with your genetic code like for people that have had sim that have similar you know genetic lines do genetic traits do these medications fare well you know, with, with your system, or do you not generally process it well? Or heart health reports, learn how genetics may influence your likelihood of developing certain heart-related conditions. Or migraines, how likely, how, how likely are you going to get migraines? What potential medications might work for you based on people with similar genetic profiles? You know, how about sleep apnea? So you can see how they could sort of keep diving in, layering in more and more exclusive content as they dig in, learn more and more, you know, do more you know, profiles, do more of these daily surveys, get more information, layer it onto the genetic data, create more exclusive consumer products. So you can see how that 29 bucks a year could be a valuable service as people go, oh yeah, I totally have sleep apnea and it's good to know that all these people that are just like me with, with regard to their genetics, they had this favorable outcome when they took this medication. That's, that's, that's a good thing to know. What about drug discoveries? How could this potentially help? So first, one should understand that the dis drug discovery industry is inherently very challenging, where it takes many years to get to market, many years just to go through trials. The vast majority fail, so over you know 90% fail, and 
of which even though the vast majority fail, it still costs billions upon billions of dollars to develop. So what if you can take a genetic profile, take a genetic database and say, hey, using genetic information of when and where it works on which people, you can actually accelerate the time of certain drugs getting to market or getting to trials. So instead of going from seven years, it could take four years, like one treatment that they're currently working on, and it increases, they're saying it doubles the probability of success. Now this is a classic example of investment banking putting lipstick on a pig, in my opinion, where they're trying to like pull one over on you because it's a 90% failure rate and they're saying it doubles the probability of success. So that means there's a 10% success rate, now it's a 20% success rate. So this is not a game changer. It's just saying, hey, it incrementally boosts your success rate from 10 to 20%. Okay, that's great. Like at the end of the day, you're still dealing with things that cost billions upon billions of dollars to try to bring to the marketplace. So if you are able to double going from 10 to 20, that is a big deal, don't get me wrong. But it isn't like, hey, now that we have genetic profiles, this, this is a shoe in like it's gonna happen. Like that, that is not the case. This is still very speculative that you're able to successfully launch new drug treatments based on this. So that, that is worth understanding, especially given that this is where the vast majority of the value, I'd argue, is gonna come in the future. And you can see they have a look into their, you know, 10 million plus people that have a lot of different ailments, whether or not it's high cholesterol, 1.7 million people of that 10 million. You can see depression, um, Crohn's disease, coronary artery, uh, all sorts of different things, psoriasis, epilepsy. So you can see digging into this and you can learn real time how these folks are doing based on these surveys. And keep in mind, the vast majority of the people that have had their genetic testing done with 23andMe are opting in for this research. So, you know, where does this go to in terms of drug discovery? Well, it started off with this strategic collaboration with GlaxoSmithKline or GSK, where GSK invested 300 million into 23andMe as an equity investment. And now there's sort of two different paths that 23andMe could choose. One is sort of a royalty if they're able to successfully help with bringing a new drug treatment to market, or you could have a 50-50 shared costs and profits where instead of just a royalty, you could get 50% of the profits if 23andMe is sort of willing to bet, saying, hey, we think we can do it. We're gonna upfront 50% of the cost, but we do get 50% of the profits that you're gonna get. That's you know one of the things that they call out and they get access to JSK's platform. That said, as I've already alluded to, bringing new drugs to market does cost billions of dollars. So this is no way a shoe in that you know, it's, it's guaranteed for, for success, but this it does reflect that they are building partnerships with the pharmaceutical development industry. And this is critical if you want to think about the long-term potential of 23andMe. And you can see how they're they're trying to build out, you know, different uh, types of products that are in the pipeline where they, you know, you see these different types of immuno-oncology saying, hey, how can we take the immune system to potentially beat cancer, beat these different types of cancer? So they have a bunch of things in the preclinical. They have one thing that's going into the phase one of the FDA treatments. That This is CD96. That's something that they're working on with GSK. So it, it, it does it does seem interesting that they have all of these different potential treatments, potential therapeutics that they're sort of, it's getting a good lead based on their genetic data bank. I would, I would frame it like that. And if they're enabled, you know, if this is just the start and they're enabled to ingrain themselves in the R&D pipeline of the major pharmaceutical developers, this could be an incredibly lucrative line of business over time. You know, where where maybe it becomes a, a in, instead of just having to show, you know put in fifty percent of the cost. What if you just you partner with all of them and you have all these royalty streams, which are incredibly high margins. So that's that's one way to frame you know this idea. The next, and this is honestly a challenging part, is let's actually dig into the financials because this is a key part of the story. And so here's the financials where you can see the cumulative genotyped customers. So cumulative number of people that have had the genetic test done going from 8 million to 11 million to 16 million over the next few years. Then this new new product offering of subscribers, this annual subscribers going from 75,000 now, um, which is, you know, here it is point, you know, nearly 100,000. This is the, all these numbers are in millions. This is this is their fiscal year ends in March. Uh, 2021. So this this is actually this most recent, nearly this most recent last 12 months. 
they're they're showing revenue of around 218 million we're going to talk about that in a second but you can see how just launching this cumulative subscribers they're making a big bet here they're they're saying look we think we could dramatically scale this up to several million people willing to pay 29 bucks a year then you know you top that off where you know you look at the gross margin of this business it's around 45 to they're saying up to 60 percent over the next few years now you know you need a breakout and they call this deliberately effectively two different segments one is consumer research consumer and research services now that's what you know the traits the health reports where that's effectively close to break even now nine million negative but you know nine million loss e negative EBITDA in this most re or this guided year and they're effectively expecting the next two years to get to profit in that segment um, whereas their cumulative or their their consolidated EBITDA is his huge cash burn over a hundred million annual cash burn that you're looking at likely for the next few years so this I would argue is the difference between doing these health and you know what are your traits and ancestry reports and that's this segment along with you know getting the getting the the subscriptions and this reflects their bet on trying to roll out drug discovery and therapeutics now the challenge here and this is why I at the start of the video I said that they're undergoing a radical transformation is that their revenue really is not Great. It really stinks, I'd argue, relative to many of the other different types of companies that you can find out there. And I think this suggests that their business model needs to have a radical change. And that's what I, you know, that's what I started talking about at the start of this video. Because their revenue, unlike most SPACs that are promising, you know, hey, we're gonna have immaterial revenue now and we're gonna be doing five billion dollars in profits, you know, in a few years from now, this company's actually saying, look, we're, we were at 400 million in revenue a few years ago, and we're still not even modeling that out a few years from now. So that's, I mean, that's a that's a road trip to nowhere um, in terms of their revenue. But they could argue, actually, yeah, you might you might think this was a road trip to nowhere, but there's actually a lot going on here between getting a bigger cumulative genotype customers launching a subscription service, um, as well as this major investment into you know this drug discovery pipeline and one could argue if you win on that you know maybe maybe they're being too conservative and if they successfully launch a, a new drug discovery it could you know be hugely profitable and that's that's one angle but this this is a big red flag when you see that revenue has effectively dropped by 50 percent in just two years i mean that's that's a problem you know that that has it written all over it and this you know just just to keep going you know, and, and this is a cl another classic example of bankers trying to put lipstick on a pig, where they show the cumulative genotype customers, cumulative versus showing the number of new, you know, spit and spit in the kit that are going out each year. Where you know this is cumulative, so you saw 1.3 to 2 to 4.4 to 7.8 to 9.8 to 11.2. It makes you think, oh, this is great. But the reality is, what's the delta or what's the change in the kits being you know purchased each year? And it's gone from 2.4 to 3.4. So that was that was their peak in fiscal 2019 to a huge drop of to 2 million to 1.4 million. So now they also showed this customer acquisition cost has dropped significantly. I don't know if this customer acquisition cost per per you know kit or if this is total customer acquisition cost. So maybe they're just spending less to get to get these kits. Either way, this is arguably what's driving that huge decline in revenue. They don't call it out specifically, but going from 3.4 four to 1.4 that's a 50 percent drop and that would explain what you're seeing here in revenue so then you have to ask yourself well why is it dropping so significantly is this more competition or is it just less general interest people don't care if if you get a test result back that tells you you like chocolate like hey i already know i like chocolate and it's up to my physician to tell me how i'm how i'm supposed to get treated or maybe more and more physicians offices are requiring you to get genetic testing done through them versus 23 and me so that's maybe that's the competitive angle you know and, and the read through here in my opinion is that launching this sort of subscription product might be really difficult if you're already starting to show a declining interest you know going from 3.4 million in one year to 1.4 million are you really supposed to get 3 million people willing to subscribe at 30 bucks a year and you might be increasing that price over time so just just something to think about like what what are the trends actually say versus what are you projecting 
what are my thoughts on the valuation based on what we've seen so far? And so, you know, you, you got to take the share price of the SPAC, multiply it by what will be the shares outstanding after the SPAC deal is completed. This is what I'd argue is closer to a fully diluted share count, which implies the deal value here is very rich. I mean, this is this is over a seven billion dollar valuation just based on the share count that they had in their presentation presentation. Oftentimes with these SPAC videos, someone asks me, hey, where are you getting this fully diluted share count? You got to go to the presentation and it shows you, you know, what what the uh, pro forma share count will be after the deal is closed. And then you take that share count and you multiply it by the, the new sh the, the current share price to get a pro forma valuation for the company. Um, and you let's let's sort of pencil in what their revenues have been. You know, this 257 is is roughly in line with what they're guiding to for this next next upcoming year. And so that's the high side. And then, you know, so I'm, I'm saying maybe there's 5% growth, 10% on the low side. What are the long-term margins? Keep in mind, they're not showing you the long-term margins here because they're still expected to be hugely unprofitable in the years ahead. So I'm, you know, I'm penciling out 15 to 25%. Maybe it's higher than that. Um, maybe it's a lot higher than that, but it's, it's, you know, I, I want to do a range um, based on, you know, what we're looking at now. And right now what we're looking at is, you know, 45, 50% gross margin. So this is, this is sort of a read through from that, you know, what's the appropriate tax rate? You know, what's the growth rate in the years ahead? And this, this becomes a question of, are you able to effectively develop, you know, this, this subscription base? Are you able to d develop meaningful revenue sources from a, you know, new drug drug delivery pipeline um, working with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, now, this sheet is part of my value proposition to you, the loyal YouTube you know subscribers, where you can click on the description of this video and click file download and you can play around with this yourself. You know, I, everything in yellow is things that you can easily tweak and change your assumptions on what the growth profile looks like in the years ahead. But, you know, the reality is putting on a, re a wide range of earnings estimates. You know, I this is this is when I'm thinking about optimized margins, I'm saying what are the types of margins that this business could do at maturity? So your return as an investor is purely driven off of what's the top line growth over time. And so, you know, you take that you take what is your assumed multiple, you know, let, let's say looking out over four or four, five years. And that's, you know, I prefer to have a logical framework for thinking about this. What's a logical valuation for this? And the reality is just taking this 20 to 50 times, 50 times is extremely rich, you know, would still effectively say that the share price is lower in a few years from now. Um, you know, if, if you get 25% year growth, 25% margins, um, you know, 50 times, and huge downside, 90% downside, um, if, you know, they don't have meaningful growth, if they continue to have this challenge of sort of offsetting the decline in the number of kits that are being shipped. Um, you know, of course, could this go higher or much higher than what I'm saying or much lower? Not, not room for much lower because I'm already saying 90 over 90 percent downside but hey you never know um but yeah you know some people could argue hey could there be a lot of upside from here and let me you know let me dig in a little bit like what does this imply you know when you're looking at this valuation because because obviously this is a logical framework I prefer to use logic for all my investment decisions um I don't want to rely on hype you know a lot of gamestop investors know how hype turns out and so you know I I, I look at this and it's sort of like um I want to be able to sleep well at night where I'm penciling out a really attractive risk reward and I'm using conservative or reasonable assumptions. Whereas here I'm using, I would argue, aggressive potential assumptions and still getting a lousy return based on the current share price and, and the fully diluted share count. Now, maybe this share count should be a little slightly higher or lower, but this was based on the company's presentation roughly. And so, you know, let's let's keep going. Like what what is this sort of negatively skewed risk reward imply? So a few things. So first of all, normally I'd save this additional detail for Unrivaled Investing Journey subscribers, but sort of as, an, as a show or display of, of goodwill to my YouTube uh, subscribers, I wanted to provide this, this extra, you know, sort of peeling back or dive into this setup. Where first of all, Richard Branson's group was a Series A investor, yet he's also, so one of the first ingress, in, investors in 23andMe, and yet he's also, his group is also setting the deal terms of the SPAC. 
So that, that does create a significant conflict of interest. Like for example, would an independent third party investor like really value this company at this rate? Like it, it really makes me wonder two years down the line, um, are they still gonna be valued around this range? Or is this sort of being biased on the fact that this deal was being struck by an investor that already invested at a significantly lower valuation and they wanna see that higher mark and so they're gonna set the deal terms at what I'd argue is a lofty valuation. Um, you know, would a truly independent third-party investor, someone that's not less necessarily a friend of Richard Branson's or you know the Virgin Group, so they're they're not someone that's like, oh yes, we, we have a friendship and that's why we're a pipe investor. Would a true independent third-party investor, I'd argue, invest at this valuation, or would they invest a lot lower, potentially diluting? their stake, you know, the, as as the Series A investor, a much lower valuation resulting in, in getting a smaller share of the pie. And another aspect is like, you know, I, I picked a picture of passing the baton and the company is burning over 100 million a year in cash. They have less than three years cash on their balance sheet. So they, I would argue, and, and keep in mind, their business is rapidly declining, 50% total decline in two years, that's a big deal. So I would argue they need to have a huge cash infusion just to make sure they successfully transition, successfully change their business model because they're going from the, hey, we're doing the spit in the kit business model to we're gonna be offering these exclusive reports that you can't get elsewhere. And these exclusive reports, you're gonna pay a, a yearly subscription. So this isn't just a one-time deal anymore, where it's one time and you can check back a few years later. Now we're gonna create a repeat customer base, which is gonna be higher margin. And we potentially start moving into this drug discovery phase where that, if we're able to get a lottery ticket there, then it's, whew, lot lot better profits. So I you know I would argue you know as a series A investor I seriously doubt their financials have tracked to what they either projected or budgeted would happen with 23 and me. I mean look they've been in this this series A investment occurred in 2007 I believe. So you know I I would be very surprised if the fundamentals. Now, of course, the valuation, they're they are picking their own valuation because they're the investors. So they could say, hey, this has performed exceptionally well. Hey, it's performed exceptionally well because you're the one setting the valuation. Has the fundamentals performed as you projected or budgeted? And I would bet if, if it was available that their projections from 2007 uh, or, or whatever, whatever they've budgeted over the past decade certainly didn't forecast a 50% decline in revenue in the last two years. That's, that's, I, I don't know, but that's what I'd be a, a sort of a gentleman's bet, uh, is that they are sort of scrambling now to sort of say, Hey, we need to make sure we successfully change this business model and we need to make sure we have the cash to do it. Well, a series A investor is effectively doubling down saying, okay, well, I don't want someone else coming in and really, you know, sort of ripping my face off at a much lower valuation, significantly diluting my stake. Let's double down, let's triple down, put a lot more cash into this. So that way we can ensure that this business model has a radical change going from a one-time sale to a subscription and potentially potentially, and this is a big potential, you know, they, they haven't done it yet. It's just preclinical and phase one. Could you have meaningful material revenue from drug discovery in the years ahead? And that's, that's what I'd argue is what's being implied by the current valuation. Now, of course, with SPACs, you do get this element of either investors that don't know what they're doing or just being hyped and people hoping for a bump and people thinking about the asymmetry of like, hey, well, if it's below 10 bucks, then I can get my cash back. So therefore it's a, it's a good speculative bet in the near term. Um, but you know, I, what I think is going on here is that people are effectively saying, I think this new business model will work, either the subscription or getting a lottery ticket with a new drug or a new therapeutic. And so if that's the case, that's the, I would argue that's the 10, 20, $30 billion question is, will they truly be able to successfully roll out new drug treatments or will they become a partner of choice 
for the pharmaceutical industry, resulting in high marginal, let's say, royalty agreements. So that's that's sort of the tricky question because they already valued at a multi-billion dollar valuation. So despite you know what I would argue is a terrible looking risk reward, I'm not actually saying definitively it's going to be a bad investment because it depends on, first of all, it depends on investment speculation, I'd argue, because there are plenty of companies with sort of lousy logical based risk reward, but then they sort of elevate higher based on the idea that, hey, one of these lottery tickets will punch out and it will work. That's not how I personally invest. And so I it, this isn't gonna be part of my journey, but I could see why someone else saying, look, I, it, it's not here yet, but you need to think five, you need to think 10, 20 years down the line where they're, they're just minting money because of all these pharmaceuticals. So that's, that's the framework, you know, Kathy Wood, I see you, you have your genomic, you know, fund of, I, I would suspect that they would be very interested in 23andMe and they'd come up with some sort of model saying by the year 3000, this, this company will be worth a trillion dollars. Um, and so, you know, there, there is that element to it where, you know, what's what's the sort of hype factor in 10, 20 years from now and how do you sort of pull up these these numbers out of the air? But based on over the next five years trying to do a logical framework, I'm just not getting there um, in terms of the valuation. But, you know, who knows how this plays out as, as an investment. Um, I personally think that there's a lot of other plays with a lot better risk reward. Um, I call those out in my potential multi-baggers that Unrivaled Investing Journey subscribers know about it. Heck, Kathy Wood recently was buying one of the potential multi-baggers that I called out back in October of 2020. It's already gone up over 100% since then. The warrants that I bought in the October 2020 potential multi-bagger went up nearly 600%. So unrivaled investing journey subscribers know what I'm talking about. But if you're interested in learning more, you know, th what, what is the journey about? Look, it's, it's what I buy, what I sell, what I hold. It's a monthly update with everything there. So my full portfolio there, but then I do have intermittent, you know, in interim updates of like, Hey, I did just buy this. You know, I, I do, I do think this is interesting. And if there's a material change to my portfolio, then I let, you know, folks know. So that's, that's the way to think about it. But the goal is, my aim is to identify at least one potential multi-bagger, one potential company that go up hundreds or thousands of percent over time each month. You can see the full catalog of contents in the description below. I recommend you check that out, sort of know what you're getting interest into if you're interested, because that, that has a list of all the exclusive content. And I break it out by, seg by section in that Google document where you can see, it's like, oh, there's my portfolio, there's multi-baggers, there's educational content. You know, I, I have a whole educational section on how to think about investing and how to think about hedging. And there's also a section on market commentary. Where are we in terms of the market? You know, do I do I think there's lots of opportunities now? Am I worried about the downside? Um, you know, and, and then there's the exclusive follow-up that I have with a lot of different stocks that you can also see. So that's, you know, if you're interested in going down that route and at the end of the day, just finding one potential multi-bagger can change your personal life journey. So if you're interested in following my life journey to try to find these potential multi-baggers, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey. And uh, if this video has been helpful for you in terms of learning about 23andMe, please make a point of subscribing and hitting that thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching.